In the first episode, we were looking at how we have this very powerful innate desire to conform to the crowd. And we also looked at how once someone's been conformed to a group's behavior, they then become a vector for that behavior to others. And so we get this thing called social contagion. Now, unfortunately, this whole process can be easily manipulated by people who understand this, who understand crowd control and human behavior. Let's go back to the elevator experiment for a second to explore the levels of control at work in this situation. So in this experiment, we have the subject, who is this naive, unknowing target of the whole thing. We have the actors who are employed to go in there and manipulate the individual to produce a desired outcome. But if we think about this for a bit longer, we realize they're not actually the ones ultimately in control here. The actors are not the ones ultimately in control in the situation. Because above them, we have the coordinators of this whole thing, or the directors, I'm going to call them. The people who devised this experiment, who set this whole thing up, and who paid the actors and told them what to do. They told them exactly how to behave to produce a certain outcome. We can visualize it like this. The directors are at the top. They decide what outcomes they want to achieve in the subject. They then employ and instruct a group of actors to go in and tell them what to do. And through them, they can almost puppeteer the subject. They can produce desired outcomes in that target. The same thing goes for the waiting room experiment. You have the unknowing subject, the mark or target, who is this woman here. You have the paid actors who are in the room with her, but then above them, you have another level of control in the directors, those who set this whole thing up to make the women behave exactly how they wished. And having started the ball rolling, the directors can then sit back because she then takes it from there. She then becomes a vector and starts spreading the behavior to others. Now, Edward Bernays, called the father of public relations, argued that to a large degree, this is basically how modern society works. He says, a small invisible government who understands the mental processes and social patterns of the masses rules public opinion by consent. He says, the voice of the people expresses the mind of the people, and that mind is made up for it by the group leaders in whom it believes, which is this group here, and by those persons who understand the manipulation of public opinion, which is the directors. We are governed and our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. So his take is that there's a small invisible group of people who understanding this whole subject can leverage the power of herd psychology to manipulate thoughts and behaviors so that we behave exactly as they wish. Then once people at the lowest level imbibe these ideas and behaviors, they then each become vectors and there's a social contagion. Have you ever wondered why many people, especially in Western countries, tend to eat bacon and eggs for breakfast? Specifically those two things, bacon and eggs, or at least think of bacon and eggs as specifically being a breakfast food. Well, while working in PR, Edward Bernays had a client called the Beech Nut Packing Company and they had a problem at the time in that they weren't selling enough bacon. They asked Bernays if he could help, and this is what Bernays did. Many years ago, our client was the Beachy Nut Packing Company. We made a research and found out that the American public ate very light breakfast of coffee, maybe a roll, and orange juice. We went to our physician, found that a heavy breakfast was sounder from the standpoint of health than a light breakfast because the body loses energy during the night and needs it during the day. We asked the physician, after telling him why we were talking to him, would he be willing at no cost to write to 5,000 physicians and asked them whether their judgment uh, was the same as his, confirmed his judgment. He said he would be glad to do it. We carried out a letter to 5,000 physicians. Obviously, all of them concurred that a heavy breakfast was better for the health of the American people than a light breakfast. That was publicized in the newspapers, newspapers throughout the country had headlines saying 4,500 physicians urge heavy breakfast 
in order to improve health of American people, many of them stated that bacon and eggs should be embodied with the breakfast, and as a result, the sale of bacon went up, and I still have a letter from Bartlett Arkell, president of Beach and Oak Packing Company, telling me so. So Bernays, as director, gets 4,500 doctors to say bacon and eggs is the healthiest breakfast. They and the newspapers who spread the information around become the clacks. And then the people start eating bacon and eggs for breakfast and it becomes a social contagion. As Bernays said, the mind of the people is made up for it by the group leaders in whom it believes, in this case, the doctors, and by those people who understand the manipulation of public opinion. So in this case, Edward Bernays himself. Our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. Now, that's not to say the outcome is always bad. In this case, bacon and eggs is a healthier breakfast option compared to cereal, I would say. In fact, I've recently pivoted away from cereal towards bacon and eggs. But the point here is just to see how easy it was for Bernays to achieve this outcome, to control the tastes and behaviours of the people. And in this next experiment, we'll see that actually sometimes the outcomes can be bad. In this experiment, there's a lecturer giving a presentation to a crowd, but halfway through, he deliberately starts speaking gibberish. The words don't make any sense. So I'm passionate about technology because I believe technology is an extension of human creativity. Today, our host, Jason Silva, is giving a free talk at a local university. Here's the amazing thing about technology. But pay attention, because while these people think they're here to see Jason give a presentation on technology, technology evolves exponentially. They're actually the subjects of a social experiment, and you're about to see how far these people will go just to fit in with a crowd. The smartphone that you guys have in your pocket is actually a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than what used to be $60 million in half a building 40 years ago. So far, the crowd seems to be following the speech. So I want to switch gears for a minute and talk about something I think is really mind-blowing as well. Have you guys ever stopped to think just about how a thought is an idea caught in the fangs of consciousness? Huh? Which is why you can put cats in hats, but not hats in cats. <laughs> well, the soup is on, so to speak. If it now sounds like Jason is speaking nonsense. Geometry, wisdom, tangerines, it all becomes possible. He is. So eat your soup. Dreamers among us dream about tangerines. E equals elephant, not the lizard. Even though he's speaking absolute nonsense, can he manipulate the crowd into giving him a standing ovation? Can they be puppeteered into applauding absolute gibberish? Well, as it turns out, it's quite easy for the lecturer, who is the director in this particular scenario, it's quite easy for him to achieve this control over the room. All he needs to do is put some actors into the audience to take the lead on a standing ovation. Two influencers, you could say, two thought leaders. And as they stand up, the rest of the crowd soon follows. It's reefer madness, geometry, wisdom, tangerines, it all becomes possible. Okay, this is getting weird. How would you react if you were in the audience? Silence? Would you get up and leave? And that is all the time I have for today. Thank you for listening, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Polite applause is one thing, but these people are giving Jason a standing ovation for spewing complete nonsense. So what's going on here? Okay. Uh, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. This, my friends, was an experiment in conformity to see if you'd give me a standing ovation even though the second half of my talk was complete gibberish. And so you guys actually proved the point. Have you ever stood for an applause simply because everyone else is? You know, he's talking about cats and hats and stuff like that, and I was just like, did what he really say merit a standing ovation and he's right but if jason's speech didn't deserve such an ovation what made this audience stand up to applaud it all started with two very enthusiastic audience members that we planted in the crowd for some added peer pressure so i see start seeing people standing up so oh, okay i'll stand up <laughs> there was a couple people that stood and were like really really enthused about standing and everybody else started standing so 
I figured it was definitely my fault. Remember from the previous episode, there are two main reasons why people conform to crowds. Number one, to gain an accurate sense of reality. And number two, to be liked. Remember what Britannica says, people want to hold accurate beliefs about the world because such beliefs usually lead to rewarding outcomes. Some beliefs about the world can be verified using objective tests, but others cannot and hence must be verified using social tests, namely comparing one's beliefs to those of other people whose judgment one respects. So when we're uncertain about reality, we look to the crowd, we employ a social test. When you want to buy a new vacuum cleaner, for example, and you don't know anything about vacuum cleaners, you don't know which ones are good, which ones are bad, you don't know the current vacuum cleaner technology, so what do you do? You look at customer reviews to see what other people are buying, what other people are saying, and you trust the wisdom of the crowd. When you need a plumber to fix your shower, but you don't know which ones are good or bad, what do you do? You look for customer reviews or going to trust pilot or something like that, and you trust the wisdom of the crowd. When we don't know personally, we employ a social test. What's everyone else saying? What are they buying? What's everyone else choosing? I'll go along with that. And that's what's happening in this lecture. The people are confused. The people are uncertain. They're saying, I don't know what's going on here. What does everyone else think about this? They employ a social test because they don't know personally. They start to employ a social test. They start to look around to see what everyone else is doing. They see these two people at the front. They see that they're clapping enthusiastically. Oh, that must mean it's good. They must know something I don't. This must be their area of expertise. Right. I'll go along with it then. So here's what I want us to notice about this. Uncertainty is actually the director's ally. Uncertainty is the director's ally here. The more uncertain we are, the more we will go with the crowd. And the more we will go with the crowd, the more that crowd can be manipulated and puppeteered because the majority of the people within it actually really don't know what's going on. The majority of people here are clapping, but they don't have a clue why they're clapping. In this case, there may have also been some people applauding because they just wanted to be nice and likable. A standing ovation doesn't happen because everyone in the audience had the idea to stand up and applaud at the same time. It happens because a few people decided to stand and everyone else just went along with it so as not to be judged as uncaring or different. I felt like everybody was going to be like, you didn't get it, it was so great. One incredibly fascinating aspect of mob mentality is how it only takes a few leaders to get the whole mob to follow. This exact technique of planting people in crowds in order to manipulate them and to produce desired outcomes is actually used in real life all the time. It's particularly prevalent on TV shows with a live studio audience like chat shows where TV directors will plant people called clacks in the audience. That's why I'm using that word. And their job as a clack is to show wild psychophantic approval for whatever's happening on the stage, to applaud, to laugh loudly, to cheer, to whistle. And the directors plant these clacks in the knowledge that if just a few get the ball rolling, it will cause a contagion and everyone in the room will get caught up in it and be convinced that they're watching something great, regardless of whether what's happening on the stage is actually any good, or indeed, regardless of if it even makes any sense, because we know in TV land, a lot of it's complete nonsense. And it's amazing what people can be whipped up into applauding and cheering for. It's amazing what people will go along with just to be part of the crowd. In fact, for this reason, Mark Twain once said, when you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. And that's really what I'm trying to achieve with this whole series. I'm asking us to pause and reflect for a second, to examine ourselves, to examine our thoughts, our words and our behaviors, and to live purposefully, to choose to live purposefully, not just to spend our lives following trends and fads without even really knowing why half the time, but to choose to live with intention and to choose carefully what is right and good and to follow it regardless of what the crowd's doing. Because if we don't examine ourselves in this respect, and learn to think critically and to live intentionally, with intention, we can live our whole lives as a kind of puppet, manipulated into doing things that really make no sense, becoming vectors for that nonsense. And we can find ourselves even standing for gibberish, fervently and passionately standing up for complete nonsense and all that without really even knowing why. Here's a topical example of people passionately standing for something, going with a crowd, without really knowing why. So I just noticed the signs that you got from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What does that mean? Well, it's quite self-explanatory. Well, it's a little <laughs> bit more complicated than that, isn't it? 
Because uh, I guess what I mean is, how would that come about? What would happen to the Israelis, etc.? I don't. I don't. I'm trying to think of how to word it. Isn't it just as self-explanatory as the area of land? It's Palestine's land. Yeah. So, so when you say Palestine, which pit do you mean? The yeah, the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip. The West Bank. West Bank. Yeah. That's it. I don't know. Build a new workers' party, a socialist alternative to Sunak and Sama for a socialist intifada. Yeah. What's a socialist intifada? If I'm being honest with you, I just got this at the stand over there. Okay. Uh, I don't actually know the definition of the word intifada. Okay. But I mean. Do any of you know the definition of the word intifada? What does from the river to the sea mean? Um, it means that Palestine should be free and should be autonomous. What river? Um, okay. The expression is not anything bad of this No, there's an actual river and an actual sea. Yeah, I'm aware of this geography. No, no, but what river, what sea? Um, the river that's literally, that literally, um, is beside Israel and the Palestinian territories. It's what? Literally it's the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. So lots of people are caught up in a crowd here, passionately chanting slogans and waving signs, but they don't know what the slogans mean and they don't know what the words on their signs mean. They don't seem to know much about the history or geopolitics of the Middle East at all. So why then are they on the street at all? Why are they fervently marching and standing up for something they don't really understand? Well, they're simply getting caught up in a social contagion. They're uncertain about what's going on, so they're using a social test. What's everyone else doing? Oh, they're marching. Okay, I'll march too. What do the people around me believe? Okay, yeah, I'll believe that too. They're also thinking, I want to be liked, or at least I don't want to be disliked by my peers, so I need to conform to the people around me for that reason too. But remember, when we follow the crowd, we can be easily manipulated by people we've never even heard of. Here's a guy that's manipulated into holding a sign that he didn't even understand. We can end up doing things in general that make no sense. We can become a vector for that nonsense, and we can end up passionately standing up for absolute gibberish. And with that, we'll take a pause there.